So, I had the Triforce Kid here on YouTube kind of comment on a video I did nine months ago. Nine months is going to be a year in June of this year, basically June 9th, where I talked about the differences of Ian Flynn and Ken Penders, especially when it came to how they wrote Sally. And, you know, first of all, I want to say thank you to those that have given me over 500 views on that so far. Hopefully we'll get more uh, after this. Uh, but the truth, but the, not the truth, but the thing is, you know, when Triforce Kid saw that video, of course he decided to comment on it. And he basically asked me some questions here in, the, in this comment that he posted uh, today. Now, I get the fact that some people have the differences when it comes between Ken and Ian. You know, I basically brought that up, you know, in that video on how I saw both men, you know, uh, treating Sally and other characters, you know, uh, during their run. So, you know, I, I could see, you know, a difference in their writing style and how they presented certain characters. But... Of course, people like Triforce Kids still, you know, basically don't believe anything certain, you know, people like, you know, Ken Penders or Ian Flynn have to say because they don't believe that basically these guys um, had the best intentions, if you will, in mind uh, for the characters. They, they really don't. They don't believe that they had the best intentions in mind. Mostly when it comes to Ian Flynn. Because you see, Triforce Kid, like many fans out there, there's no denying that, you know, whatsoever, uh, excuse me there, uh, truly believes that Ian Flynn, you know, never really cared whatsoever about the Freedom Fighters. He never really cared about Sally's character. And look, Triforce Kid, like many, as I've mentioned many, 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 many times before here on my channel in various videos, um, has a right to their opinion. You know, if they feel, you know, a certain way about someone and how they write a character or they present a character, you know, that's their opinion. They have a right to, to feel that way. But, you know, here's the thing. But his thing, Triforce Kid really looks at the fact that Ian Flynn, you know, is straight up lying on how he feels about the Freedom Fighters, how he, felt, how he feels about Sally as a character and stuff like that, just based on things that they have mentioned on various, you know, various occasions. You know, so for example, you know, for example, you know, he, like I said, commented today on the video, and this is what he had to say to me, and I quote, this is what he had to say to me, and I quote, uh, it is what Triforce Kid had to say, and I quote, you know, when he was bringing all this up. This is what he had to say, and I quote. Um, here's my beef with Ian Flynn, and the words that, okay, let me, let me rephrase that. Let me, okay, let me rewind. Let's start again. <clears throat> this is what Triforce Kid had to say. This is what Triforce Kid had to say uh, when he commented on my video that I did nine months ago. This is what he had to say, and I quote. Here's my beef with Ian Flynn and the words that fall out of his, you know, face hole. <laughs> That's what he called it. And let me reread that. This is, this is what Triforce Kid starts off by saying, and I quote, Here's my beef with Ian Flynn and the words that fall out of his face hole. He lies. He lies a lot, especially about his, quote unquote, love for Sally Acorn and the Knothole Freedom Fighters. So... Okay, that's his opinion on how he feels about Ian and how he sees Ian truly feeling about the characters of Sally, Rhoda, Bunny, Antron, Dulcie, you name it. And then he decides to ask me this. He decides to ask me uh, this, if you will. He decides to bring this up, you know, and I quote. This is what he says directly to me, and I quote. You seem like an intelligent fellow, so I'll ask you this question. And here's what he asked me, and I quote, <clears throat> If someone told you, I love the Freedom Fighters, I love Sally, but despite saying this repeatedly, he doesn't show it. Instead, he puts them through heck in a handbasket. He kills off Sally three times, once during his fan days, where he has someone blow Sally's brains out rather graphically in a fan comic, that fan comic being Other M, 
but having her shot to death off screen, one, uh, 225, and then sacrificing herself, elf, then, Ian had, uh, then Ian had her modified in canon to the point she couldn't be, she couldn't be de-roboticized. The lore of the universe of Archie Sonic clearly stated that robotization could be reversed as long as the Robian's original parts were intact and unmodified. Meaning, like Bunny, a uh, meaning like meaning folks like Bunny couldn't be de-roboticized because her parts had been replaced by cybernetics after her body began rejecting the roboticized limbs of her body. Okay, so basically. You know, basically, what he's bringing up to me here, what he's bringing up to me here, ladies and gentlemen, and I'll reread that right now, so you guys, just in case you guys gonna check it out you for yourself, and I'll put it in the description if you guys want to look at it. I'll put it in the description. You know, but this is what he says, and I quote: "Oh, um, you seem like an intelligent fellow, so I'll ask you this question." And again, this is the question he asked: "If someone told you." I love the Freedom Fighters, I love Sally, but despite saying this repeatedly, he doesn't show it. Instead, he puts them through heck in a handbasket. He kills off Sally three times, once during his fan comic where he had someone blow Sally's brains out rather graphically in a fan comic. By having her shot to death off screen, issue 225, and then sacrificing herself, then Ian had her modified in canon to the point, oh, uh, to the point she couldn't be de-roboticized. The lore of the universe of Archie Sonic clearly stated that robotization could be reversed as long as the Robian's original parts were still intact and unmodified. Meaning folks like Bunny couldn't be de-roboticized because her parts had been replaced by cybernetics after her body began rejecting the roboticized limbs of her body. Now, I get where he's coming from there. Yes, as I've mentioned several times when it came to the power ring, you know, for example, how can you modify a power ring? How can you modify that to resist giving a roboticized citizen back the free will, even if the body's been weaponized, you know, beyond recognition? How, how can you make that possible? It's not possible, in my opinion. So I get where they're coming from with this. Now, continuing on, you know, he, he continuing on, he says this, and I quote, He also had Antoine rendered uh, comatostic, or uh, comatost. Okay, let me read that. <clears throat> this is what he continues on saying, and I quote, He also had Antoine rendered comatost, basically in a coma, broke Rotor's back, and then had Bunny de-roboticized via the Genesis wave, ruining any pugnancy or agency the character had, taking away a character with disabilities from the fan base for no reason other than he can't write within the confines of what came before him. A true professional in the comic industry would be able to retcon a universe without ruining parts of a character that made them unique or gave the character's existence a level, a level of pugnancy that otherwise wouldn't exist without the adversity the character had to go through. In Bunny's case, she was roboticized against her will and saved at the last second by Sonic, and thus instead of weeping and moping, moping and being down on herself over it, she turned those robotic limbs in, against the creator and used them to help the Freedom Fighters. And I get what he's saying there. I get, I get what he's saying there. He's bringing up all these, you know, negative moments that occurred, you know, to the characters, to the main core cast, um, if you will, that makes it seem like, you know, maybe he doesn't really have the, you know, best intentions in mind. But then he continues on, and I quote, I ask you again, would someone who loves the Freedom Fighters put them through so much pointless pain and suffering? Let me reread that. <clears throat> he says, he continues on, and I quote, I ask you again, would someone who loves the Freedom Fighters put them through so much pointless pain and suffering? Would someone who loved Sally Acorn have her graphically killed in their, quote, fan comic, and then once they get an actual gig working for Archie, kill her off twice more in two alternate timelines, Sonic Universe and the main timeline. Would someone who loves the Freedom Fighters reduce Bunny to a little more than arm candy for Antoine? 
Would someone who loves the Freedom Fighters have rode his back broken so he's less useful than he ever was prior to the incident? Would you believe someone who told you, I love the Freedom Fighters, after doing all of that to them? I sure as hell wouldn't. Actions speak louder than words. So I get what he's saying there. And yes, it does seem like maybe Ian is, you know, pretty much being hypocritical in what he presents. Yes, there is no doubt that many of the things they brought up do have merit. You know, they do have some merit to it. And again, it does feel like it's going against what Ian Flynn is saying. But, as I've mentioned several times before, and I think even in the video I did nine months ago, you know, I said there basically, and, and I think I've said this in numerous other videos and audio podcasts, that, you know, what Ian, just like those before him, like Ken and Carl, you know, what they're doing is basically writing a story that's going to grab your attention. Whether we like the direction they're going with the characters or we don't, they're doing this because they're trying to grab your attention and any potential new readers' attentions to the comic to keep them invested. That is why, unfortunately, despite how we feel about these actions, you know, and these motives against these characters, these beloved characters, iconic characters, despite how we might feel about those, uh, motives, it's being done because it's to get attention on the comic. I mean, look, I didn't like the Mecha Sally arc from beginning to end because I felt like it was unnecessarily needed, alright? I felt like it was something that could have been done within maybe four months, six months, eight months, maybe a year at most, and that's it. You know, you didn't have to drag it on for as long as it was dragged. And also, I didn't like the fact that it was going to present Sally in a way to where we all know that wasn't Sally, and basically, if you look at it from, like, say, a mental perspective, an astral plane, you know, perspective in the mind, you know, it's basically, you know, like you're seeing, you know, this roboticized version of Sally doing these things, and mentally, in an astral plane, like, part of her mind, Sally is stuck in a cell just watching all this ha happen, and she can't get out to stop it. You know, and... And, and, and again, it's despite how I might feel about the arc, I know it was done to get people's attention, to get them talking, but all it really did, unfortunately, was turn fans against Ian because it's like, look, we get it. You're about shock and value. You're about shock over storytelling. You're about shock over quantity, over quality. We get it. We get it. You can move on now. We understand now. You know, so... Yeah, so yeah, despite how I might feel about it, you know, I get why Ian did it. It was about shock value. But sometimes the shock value, I will say this, wears out over time and gets too repetitive. And that's kind of what's been going on with Ian up to even now with IDW. Which is why, thankfully, I'm sure someone in that little, you know, inner circle that they have that, you know, helps, you know, implore Sonic lore, more lore and, you know, and more lore and background and, you know, and all that to the Sonic uh, franchise and the characters. Thankfully, they're probably, you know, telling Ian, yeah, you need to take a little bit of a break here, dude, or else you're going to get repetitive. And that's why Evan Stanley comes in and takes over once in a while. But... Again, I, I understand what he's saying. I mean, Antron getting, I mean, Bunny, I mean, Antron being put in a coma, you know, Bunny getting de-roboticized, you know, un, uh, you know, surprisingly thanks to Nagus and the not well, not just the Genesis way, but being crystallized, you know, um, you know, Rhoda having his back broken. It's like I, I get. I get you look at all I get the fact that you look at all these moments and you're like how can this be a person that li that loves these characters that says they are behind these characters they want these characters back hack in some way they're fighting to get them into IDW as best they can how can someone that says that you know be honest about uh, honest about it if they're doing the opposite visually so I, I get I get where he's coming from I really do you know, I, I get where he's coming from. I get where anybody that feels the same way is coming from, you know, from that situation, from that perspective. I understand. You know, hold on. Like I said, I, I completely understand where he, where Triforce Kid and anybody else that agrees with him is coming from. I mean, there are people on Twitter, 
believe it or not, like Chrono Hero and a few others that feel the same way at times when they look back at some of these moments like, you know, what sense does this make or how is this person, you know, a fan of these characters as they're putting them through all this crap? You know, I get it. I understand that. So, you know, so yeah, let's uh, continue on here. This is what he says, and we're going to close it out here with this. And again, I'll provide it uh, in the description. But this is what he says, and I quote, Ian Flynn ruined all... Okay, this is what he said. <clears throat> Let me start again. <clears throat> this is what he says, and I quote, Ian Flynn ruined all of that because he couldn't stand that he had to work with the Sate Am team and all that lore that had been established prior to him becoming the lead writer of the series. It didn't help that Mike... Uh, Politro, the shitty skin flint, that's what he, or the shifty skin flint, as he calls him. It didn't help that Mike, uh, it did, okay, let me read that. <clears throat> let me read that, and I quote, it didn't help that Mike Politro, the shifty skin flint, was the one responsible for writing in, of, uh, for writing in, of, uh, for writing in the slap we all hate so much. He knew nothing about the characters or their personalities or or their interactions over the last 25 years years the comic had been in production. In fact, his editorial debut was the slap, and everyone else denied having anything to do with writing it while, my, while Mr. Politro remained awfully quiet about it because nobody was blaming him. They were blaming everyone but him for it. It has been claimed that retconning the entire universe was Mike's idea, and Flynn was all too happy to destroy decades of what came before him so he could write uh, whatever bullcrap he wanted to without those pesky creators' uh, contributions to the work getting in his way of making Sonic you know, what, he wanted, what he wanted it to be. So yeah, he doesn't, so obviously here towards the end, he doesn't just you know, put the blame you know, on Ian Flynn or anything. You know, well, he does put a majority of it on Ian, but he also puts it on Mike Politro, who uh, began, uh, who obviously, I guess, according to Triforce Kid here, and maybe some of you guys can correct me uh, in the comments in the live chat, uh, basically Mike Politro came into being the editor around 134 and was the one that approved the slap to be in the story. Even though we've heard various times that there was other ways of going about it, but Mike basically, uh, the editor at the time, which I guess was Mike, um, at that time, approved it to go this way uh, instead. And I guess artistically he approved, you know, the visualness, you know, of it happening as well. So, look, I, I, I get it. I, I understand, you know, where... Like I said, I understand where Triforce Kid is coming from, along with anybody else that agrees with agrees with him uh, in this matter. I do, I do get it. I understand that. And look, you know, look, has Ian Flynn learned his lesson overall? You know, now that he's moved over from Archie to IDW, has he learned his lesson? I'm, I'm not too. I'll be honest with you. I'm not really sure, and I'm too. I'm not too sure about it. But I will say this. I will say this that obviously he still has a lot to learn. I mean, he's been doing this since 2006, guys, officially. So he's been doing it for almost 20 years. 20 years, 17 years this year, 20 years in three years. But the point is, even. Even the most established legendary comic book writers still have a lot to learn when it comes to writing characters and stories, especially if, what, especially if those characters and stories are passed on to them from a previous uh, regime or a previous writer that had come before them, and that writer decided to move on to something else or do something you know, differently career-wise. So yeah, even the most legendary of writers out there, Marvel and DC and you know um, Image and you know even IDW before they got the Sonic license and all that, they and Dark Horse and all of them, they still have a lot to learn. You know, even despite being in the business for decades and decades, if you will. And Ian Flynn is one of those guys that, even though he's going to be going on 20 years, you know, officially in this, you know, in this field, that has allowed him to expand outside of it, you know, as well from a writing standpoint, he still has a lot to learn. 
he still has a lot to learn. And I think part of that learning process now is being part of that inner circle that helps develop lore for the overall Sonic franchise, especially when it comes to the comics and stuff. And, you know, part of that lesson, as I mentioned, is probably, you know, his fellow inner circle mates telling him, hey, take a break. You know, once in a while, like, take a break. You know, get away from the comic, do something else, you know, take a vacation, whatever, let somebody else handle the, ha- handle the writing duties so that way you don't get overwhelmed or you don't get too repetitive. And thankfully, you know, that's happening right now with, you know, people like Ian, like Ivan Stanley and others coming in to basically uh, ride the ship, if you will, or captain the ship, you know, in his absence. But yeah, you know, again, he still has a uh, look. I'll admit he still has lots to learn. I mean, the Metal Virus arc, just like the Mecha Sally arc, I've made comparisons about that. You know, is an example of he still has a lot to learn. Like he, like basically, like the Mecha Sally arc, he didn't have to drag the Metal Virus arc out as long as he did. You know, he didn't have to get repetitive with it as much as he did, just like he did the Mecha Sally arc. So. You know, he still has a lot to learn there, and obviously after that Metal Virus arc, I'm, I'm assuming, just mere speculation on my part, I'm assuming he probably got talked to by IDW and Sega, and they're like, hey, that's the last, hey, they're probably like, hey, we enjoy your writing, this is why we want you on other projects, but please, from now on, if you're going to do these arcs, limit them only to maybe four, six issues at most, and that's it. You know, make it easier for yourself and us and, and, and the consumer. Again, I'm not saying that's what happened. I'm just speculating that maybe he was pulled aside and asked, if not suggested, to kind of tone it down from a story, from an issue length wise when it comes to the stories. You know, so, you know, so, maybe, so maybe that's what's happening because we're starting to see stories be a lot less you know, ling- you know, not lingering, but uh, we're starting to see arcs linger for a lot less, you know, a lot less longer than they typically would in the past. I'll put it that way. But yeah, he still has to basically, uh, like I say, he still has a lot to learn. And I think one of the biggest lessons he's going to be learning, you know, while he's at IDW and possibly working on other projects, is sometimes shock value is not the answer. You know, shock value. You know, uh, you know, what if, you know, value, you know, tension value. It's sometimes not always the answer. I mean, when people saw what was going on in the recent issues of IDW with Tangle and Whisper, you know, it's like, would, he, would Ian stoop to that level? Like, would he end that? And I came on here and I said, before, you know, before uh, the recent issue came out, which I think was, what, 59, uh, 58, I believe? I said after 57 that 58 basically would show that Ian would not do that because, again, it would not sit well with IDW and it would not sit well with Sega, and he knows it. And guess what? I was right. I was right about that. You know, basically, you know, he, ba- he basically, of all, th- surprisingly, had Whisper out of the characters admit her wrongness and how she's been acting because of what she's been through. So. You know, so in turn, he gave great, he gave some decent character development to a beloved character, and making them realize, hey, I cannot, I cannot be this way anymore. I cannot let the person that betrayed me in my friend, in my original team, stay in my head anymore. So, so, uh, so knowing that obviously Sega and IDW probably wouldn't be fond of him teasing, if not potentially doing a temporary breakup of Tangle and Whisper, he went the other direction. Because I'm not going to deny it. I'm not going to deny it here. I truly believe, I truly believe he was probably considering doing a temporary breakup, and he probably submitted that as a potential direction for the story, for the issue of the story to go. And they said, "No, you're not doing that. Come up with something else." And that's when he probably presented the backup of, "Okay, here's Whisper admitting she was wrong and her fault, and da da da." I would not be surprised if maybe that's what happened. Again, that's mere speculation. But, like I said, he still has a lot to learn. He still has a lot to learn. And obviously, people looking back at what he did in Archie Sonic, you know, to the Freedom Fighters, what he did to Sally, and that's claiming even now that he still is a fan of them, he still, belo- he still loves them, he still wants to see them in the IDW-verse, or the IDW-Sonic-verse. You know, 
you know, you can't blame people to you can't blame people in saying that they find that hard to swallow and believe, because if that was true, then he should have already you know gotten down to it. He should have already you know found a way to make it happen, and not you know you know and not constantly dilly dally around about it. Out of it, you know, time and time again, when somebody asks them a question, you know, when it that pertains to it, it's kind of like you know Ken Penders. Ken Penders recently came out on Twitter and basically made it sound like he was on the verge of finally uh, releasing the Lawless Suit Chronicles, the Shattered World of the Shattered Wind, uh, Mirror Crisis, whatever it's called, the Lawless Suit Chronicles. He basically said he he basically made it sound like he was on the verge of doing it. You know, it was like it was this close. It was like just inches. You know, mere moments away from happening, and yet he's been saying that for decades, for at least the past decade or so, ever since he got control of his, you know, OC characters, um, not that long ago. You know, he's been saying that for over a decade, ever since he got control of his characters, you know, officially, uh, not that long ago. And people find it hard to believe whether or not he's telling the truth there. Because, you know, he keeps saying it's going to happen, but it feels like it's taking forever. And it's like, you know, okay, you're saying it's going to happen. It's going to happen. But when? How? You know, you know, uh, do you got, you know, it's like, when? How? Do you finally have a scheduled release date? You have a, do you have a, you know, uh, estimated retail price for it and all that? People want answers because he keeps saying it's going to happen. It, it makes it sound like it's going to happen very soon. But then you have to wait another like year or six months or eight months before you get another answer. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like in that vein to where people who are, believe it or not, invested to see exactly what Ken Penders is going to present, you know, with the Lawless Suit Chronicles, are starting to, you know, waver and, you know, wonder if whether or not Ken actually has anything truly completed and ready to go, or if he's just making up BS along the way and presenting that BS when he feels the opportunity is right to update people. You know, so, so yeah, it's kind of in that vein in a similar vein to like Ian Flynn and him constantly talking about how he loves the Freedom Fighters, how he loves Sally Acorn, how he wants to fight, how he's fighting to get him in ITW, and yet there's no end result. There is no, um, I guess you could say, evidence to back it up. So, so yeah, it's, it's just one of those situations where people are like, well, you know, if you are, if you truly mean what you say, then show us. Show us some evidence. Prove to us you're doing it. And yet you don't get nothing. And this is why people like Triforce Kid don't believe him. Not because of what he did to the characters in the original Archie run, but because obviously what he's doing in the IDW Sonic run as well at times. So, again, I get what Triforce Kid is coming from. You know, I get it. I understand it. You know, like I said, I was not fond of the Mecha Sally arc. Everybody knows that. But I understand why Ian did it. You know, uh, unfortunately, I understand why he did it. But again, I get why people feel the way they do about Ian in the long run. I really do. But let me know what your guys' thoughts are. Let me know, in the end, how do you feel about Ian Flynn? Do you agree with Triforce Kid? Do you think Ian Flynn is just full of crap and he doesn't really care about the characters? Or do you think Triforce Kid is reading too much into this and not being patient enough to see what potentially Ian brings to the table? And you think maybe Ian Flynn coming out and constantly saying this, you know, how much he cares about the characters, how much he cares about Sally Acorn, how much he's trying to, you know, fight to get them in IDW Sonic, do you think maybe it's sort of the, you know, very similar and an equivalent to Ken Penders coming out once in a while and updating us on the Law of Suit Chronicles and making it sound like that, you know, we're this much closer, like we're just mere moments, mere weeks, mere months away from its release? And in the long run, we basically get diddly squat. What are your thoughts? Let me know down below in the comments as well as in the live chat during the premiere. Like the video. Click the upper left-hand corner to check out my Teespring store for merchandise you can't get anywhere else. Also, support me at Venmo at brian walmer 2 and at Cash App at BWRosses98. Also, check me out at Vimo at BWRosses for content you can't get anywhere else, especially some of the newer content. Also... Check me out at B.W. Rose's Discussions and all your favorite audio podcast locations except for Pandora, where you will get an audio podcast version of this. 
um, as well. Also check me out at divanart.com, says bvw1979, and at patreon.com, says bwrosses, with a support me with a $1 or $3 tier. But guys, let me know what your thoughts are. Comment below, live chat during the premiere. Do you agree with Triforce Kid, or do you think he's reading too much into it? Let me know, and until next time, I'm out.